Hi, and welcome everybody to today's webinar on the topic of heart, the other organ. We have two fantastic presenters for you today. And before we introduce them, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. For those of you who may have never joined this webinar before or used this platform before, um, on the bottom left-hand corner is where you can type in questions into the chat box. So any questions that come up during the webinar, feel free to submit them at any time. And once um, the presentations are completed, our moderator will um, navigate those questions for you. Also, uh, we are recording this webinar, so we are not able to open the line. So that, that's going to be the way that you're going to be posing your questions. Coming up, and registration is open for this, on October 19th is our next annual Brain Death Declaration webinar on the topic of um, a nursing perspective on brain death. And so this is a great webinar for all the nurses and RTs working with brain dead patients. And coming up on October 26th is our next transplant webinar focused on undertaking and superintending of pediatric and adult population non-adherence. For today's webinar, we are offering one step C credit and 1.2 nursing contact hours, courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. Now, everybody who's listening to the webinar is entitled to claim continuing education credits. If you are listening in a group, and many of you are, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead, and then you will be able to complete the evaluation and, and claim your um, certificate depending on which one you want. Also, please note for nursing you have 14 days to claim your CEs, and for SEPCs you have 30 calendar days. At this point, I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is William Recklin. He is a member of our Get Connected webinar faculty and did a great job in putting this webinar together and inviting our speakers. And he is a supervisor of referral management at One Legacy. I'm going to turn it to William to introduce our speakers. Thank you, William. Thank you, Haiti, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to get to moderate the Alliance's Get Connected webinar. Uh, Halloween edition for 2017. We have two excellent speakers for everybody today. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Nader Habashi and Dr. John Kabashigawa uh, for taking the time uh, today to join us and discuss the subject of heart resuscitation and utilization. So heart, the other thoracic or organ, is obviously a play on the old uh, line promoting pork the other white meat. Uh, for anyone that's worked in the field of donation and transplantation, for any length of time knows that the lungs generally get the lion's share of the attention uh, regarding resuscitation and transplantation. And we all thought it was about time to get uh, to give the heart a little TLC and attention. So with that in mind, I'm happy to introduce our two speakers, starting with uh, Dr. Nader Habashi. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, an attending physician, and the medical director of the multi-trauma uh, critical care unit, and the clinical uh, medical director of Respiratory Therapy Department at the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Additionally, Dr. Abashi serves as the Medical Director of Maryland's Organ Procurement Organization, the Living Legacy Foundation, and the Medical Director of uh, Clinical Services for the, the Los Angeles, California-based Organ Procurement Organization, One Legacy. Our uh, second speaker is Dr. John Kabashigawa, who is a Professor of Medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center and the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. Chief Medical Officer of the California Heart Center Foundation, DSL Thomas D. Gordon Chair in Heart Transplantation Medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center, Director for Advanced Heart Disease, Director of Heart Transplantation, and Associate Director of Clinical Affairs at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for joining us today. And to get us started with the subject of cardiac dysfunction and interventions to restore function, in the organ donor setting, Dr. Nader Habashi. Please take it away. Thank you, William. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And let's see if I can get my first slide up. Okay. <clears throat> well, since it is uh, 21 days uh, from Halloween, I thought we'd start with uh, the idea of being scared to death by recanting some ghost stories. Um, and actually, the idea really is, can you be scared to death and actually have a sudden cardiac death related to being stressed? 
Now, of course, this is typically dismissed as folklore, uh, but has, you know, there's even biblical references to, to these kinds of encounters. So interestingly, in 1971, uh, a group of researchers decided to look into this a little bit more carefully, and they decided to screen uh, newspapers, uh, primarily local newspapers from Rochester, but abroad as well. And they looked into whether any of these stories would make any sense at all. And they looked at 170 patients, and they excluded you know, anything that had any remote uh, relationship to suicide. And they found the ultimately 16 patients that they were able to gather a lot of information on. And actually, the, if you read the paper, there's a, quite a bit of detail here. This is information from eyewitnesses, from attending physicians, medical examiner, and so on. And they added a little bit more to the idea that stress could, in fact, uh, result in uh, some sudden cardiac death. Now, instead of it being folklore, we have learned a lot more about that relationship between extreme stress and the potential to actually injure organs, and in particular, the heart. And some of that is really not completely understood, but we, we definitely have a better understanding of the relationship between stress. And stress, you know, I would probably change that word a little bit more precisely to catecholamine release. And that stress and catecholamine release, typically that we see with brain injury, can actually lead to a lot of cardiac dysfunction. In addition, there's a lot of inflammatory response that goes along with these patients because brain injury is actually inflammatory. And that's why we have the, let me see if my pointer works, we have the um, inflammation here, we have increased intracranial pressure and we have the activation of the neuroendocrine pathway. And for example, many of our patients have loss of posterior pituitary function and develop diabetes insipidus, which that actually produces a state where you have a, a hypovolemic plasma volume, and that also drives catecholamine surging. And so at the end result, we have this massive systemic release of catecholamines central catecholamines actually released in the, directly in the myocardium, and then the adrenal glands secre secreting catecholamines. This all leads to essentially what creates is an ischemia reperfusion injury and eventually a calcium influx into the myocyte and actually kills the myocyte, and you get a contraction band necrosis. And, of course, that's going to lead to a heart that's actually relatively dysfunctional. And uh, then the feedback, of course, becomes, well, the patient's blood pressure goes down, the cardiac output goes down, all the organs are at risk now, and, of course, this makes things worse by driving more catecholamines. And we just get into this perpetual loop. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so this is why this may be a, an issue for us to try to understand a little bit better and to see if there's anything that we can, you know, use to combat this. So let's go into a little bit more detail on just some classifications, you know, because the literature is still, I would say, in flux. And generally speaking, you there's a multitude of terms out there. There's neurogenic stunned myocardium. There's stress-induced cardiomyopathy, Takasubo, uh, broken heart syndrome. By the way, the stress can actually be happy, too. So there are cases where people are extraordinarily happy. Uh, in, in fact, one case, uh, uh, a father and son were united after 20 years of being estranged and the father was so happy he immediately dropped dead on seeing his son. So again, you can be happy or you can be sad and either way you could have the, it's called the potential broken heart syndrome. Now, some other types of classifications, people have looked at uh, where the sort of dysfunction is in the heart. Is it in the basilar segments, the apical segments? And some people wanna call the Takasubo more apical and then just the generic, uh, uh, neurogenic stun myocardium basal. There seems to be a predilection for females and males depending on which one you're looking at, um, but I would have to say that probably that these are a continuum of the underlying pathophysiology and it may turn out that this sort of uh, discrete differences may not be that critical in terms of the ultimate pathophysiologic disruption that occurs. And it definitely seems that the mechanism uh, is very, very similar.
Now, here's just a list of uh, associations with uh, neurogenic stun myocardium um, that are that's reversible left ventricular dysfunction. Again, we talked about emotional stress, both pleasant and unpleasant, traumatic brain injury, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, ischemic stroke, Guillain-Barre, epilepsy, status epilepticus, acute uh, spinal cord infarction, sepsis systemic or actual CNS infections, uh, catecholamine-induced cardiomyopathy that you see with pheochromocytoma, which is another it's a renal tumor that secretes a lot of catecholamines that gives them a reversible cardiomyopathy. And there is some thought to perhaps some of this is related to vasospasm, although I would have to say that there's probably less evidence for that uh, per se. Now, one thing that is relatively consistent is that there is a high degree of catecholamines mm -hmm. on the systemic side. Now, despite the high levels of catecholamines, it doesn't really have a correlation with the severity of cardiac dysfunction. As we'll discuss later, the rate of herniation might be more important than the absolute level of uh, catecholamines. It seems as though the local catecholamine concentration of the myocardium may be the more significant one. And what we are talking about here is ventricular dysfunction of some type. It can be diastolic dysfunction. For example, 80% of patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage in various studies will have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction, wall motion abnormalities, that's the sort of full spectrum. But ultimately, it's reversible. And I think that's really the key thing uh, for this whole topic is that this is a reversible type of myocardial dysfunction. But these are basically the, the hallmarks of the syndrome. A lot of catecholamines, a lot of uh, stress, um, and um, some a ventricular dysfunction that ultimately becomes reversible. So coming back to uh, the catecholamines, why is this sort of the predominant idea that, uh, that catecholamines play a major role, and what's sort of the evidence for it? Well, the evidence for it really stems from a multitude of studies in animals that, that um, do show that if you and again, I'll use the example of the baboon here, but if you use uh, any animal and you pharmacologically or surgically do a sympathectomy, in other words, the catecholamines at the level of the heart are no longer going to be able to affect the heart, you completely prevent this even if the animal herniates, which we know is one of the highest levels of uh, catecholamine release is when you actually herniate during brain death. And, um, but you can completely block this. You can use various drugs to block this and so on. We know that patients with uh, pheochromocytoma have these cardiomyopathies, and once you treat them, their cardiomyopathy reverses. And uh, when you look at the histology, what you see is, is something very, very typical of what cardio, uh, catecholamine cardiotoxicity looks like with central band necrosis a lot of neutrophil, and ultimately fibrotic changes in the actual heart, or an actual remodeling of the heart. Now, contraction band necrosis is actually found on autopsy quite a high level. In, in some papers, 89% of uh, people with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage have some degree of, of uh, contraction band necrosis on autopsy, as 52% with stroke uh, of stroke patients that uh, on aut autopsy have this particular problem. Uh, so if we go into this just a little bit further and sort of the mechanism of, of what happens with catecholamines, and what they do is they change uh, essentially what happens with calcium flux into, into the cell. And unregulated calcium movement into the cell you know, for example, using prolonged uh, beta-1 receptor uh, changes will ultimately result in calcium moving into the cell, binding mitochondria, and actually killing the cell, and ultimately repleting the ATP uh, stores in the, in the myocytes. And this ultimately would lead to uh, some necrosis, cardiac necrosis. Now, the cardiac necrosis is actually more in line with the the distribution of, of the nerve terminals rather than a vascular distribution, which would be more typical of 
coronary disease or ischemic uh, heart disease related to occlusive coronary disease. So it doesn't really follow a vascular distribution. It follows more the, the uh, distribution of the, the uh, nerves. In fact, that's one of the ideas why you have apical ballooning is there is an increased concentration of receptors in the apex of the uh, myocardium. And that may be why you get a significant change in that particular region. Just to touch a little bit about the genetics, um, there is some work that has been done to suggest there is a genetic predisposition. Some would, would argue there's a, a female versus male predisposition, but genetically these have the the 1AR and the 2AR uh, deletion genotypes have been associated with a greater likelihood of LV dysfunction. Um, but that's, um, I'm sure there's more to it than that, um, but that's what we have in terms of this current investigations about the genetics. When we look at um, probably one of the better studied uh, types of brain injury associated with neurogenic stun myocardium, it would definitely be subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I'm referring to aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, not so much traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which isn't really, it's more on the superficial side of the cortex versus the aneurysmal hemorrhage tends to be sort of deeper in the brain. And definitely the uh, insular cortex and the hypothalamus are some of the areas that have been key in understanding some of the pathophysiology of, of uh, the brain heart uh, interactions. If you try to diagnose this by enzymes and EKG with subarachnoid hemorrhage, you would say that just about 100% of the patients do have some degree of uh, enzyme leak and uh, ECG changes. But if we change that definition a little bit to include uh, that you have to include some degree of dysfunction of the heart, mm -hmm. such as uh, depressed ejection fraction or wall motion abnormalities, we're more in the range of 30 to 40 percent of patients with subarachnoid aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage having LV dysfunction. And about 15 percent, if we break those down a little bit further, will have a, an EF of less than 50 percent and mm -hmm. essentially have global systolic dysfunction. But a fair number have a regional wall motion abnormalities, but their, um, their EF, or global left ventricular function, is 50 percent or greater. Uh, but yet they still have some wall motion abnormalities. And then as a subcategory, the actual apical ballooning of Takasubo would be somewhere between 1% to 6% of these patients. In general, when you have this kind of uh, involvement where you have some left ventricular dysfunction, uh, you generally in these patients have a higher rate of complications, pulmonary edema, prolonged intubation, more, more uh, days on vasopressors, and more vasospasm, ischemia, and essentially high morbidity, and ultimately mortality. Now, the reason why I say this is because, obviously, this is how many patients come to us in organ donation, is they've already gone through this whole process. And then the final act of herniation will just be another sort of massive amount of catecholamines on top of all this already uh, uh, hostile environment as far as the heart's concerned. So let's just look at uh, some ways to diagnosing this. Of course, uh, we can look at enzymes. And again, um, the enzymes are, troponin is certainly better than a lot of other enzymes, but it's really not, it's not that uh, universal in all these patients. So 20 to 30%, depending on which paper you read, would show, suggest a troponin leak. Um, but if you look for Perhaps, again, the definition being more wall motion abnormalities or depressed EF, you may have a, a, a different number. And, for example, 47% of the patients that actually do have wall motion abnormalities by echo really did not have a troponin leak, and it didn't really correlate well with um, whether we have, you know, uh, neurogenic stunning or not. <laughs> 
Another thing we could look at from a biomarker perspective is uh, a natriuretic peptide, brain natriuretic peptide, and this seems to correlate a little bit better with uh, some of these parameters. So there seems to be a better correlation uh, with regional wall abnormalities, diastolic, diastolic dysfunction, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary edema, and uh, tro tro troponin leak, and left ventricular ejection fraction below 50%. So this might be a more uh, accurate marker for this dysfunction. But ultimately, this is a diagnosis we make by echo in the right setting with a compatible patient. Now, when uh, we look at uh, the most severe cardiac dysfunction, certainly from a lot of the work that was done in animals, it's the rate of intracranial pressure rise. It seems to be a big, big component to how massive the catecholamine surge is and how dysfunctional the heart gets. We forget a lot about the right ventricle, mainly because we're always talking about the left ventricle, but the right ventricle is, is a very important ventricle because, of course, it has to push blood through the lung, which is frequently dysfunctional, and actually help fill the left ventricle. And this ventricle is not really um, doesn't handle dilation and ischemia very well. So any load on the right ventricle becomes a problem. And certainly there is a change in the pulmonary vascular resistance with catecholamines, and this actually leads to a big load on the right ventricle as well. So it can be affected typically more than uh, the left ventricle. In human donors and animal models, if you look for right ventricular dysfunction, you see a significant amount of it. Maybe 50% of the patients will have some degree of right ventricular dysfunction despite having adequate ejection fractions. So is there anything we can do about this? Well, one of the things we could do is this idea of glucose insulin potassium, or what some people would call GIC. And GIC is something that's been around for a long time. And uh, it's been used in a spectrum of diseases, acute myocardial ischemia, chronic ischemia, hibernating myocardium, been used in sepsis, heart failure, in uh, ischemia reperfusion prevention. It also has sort of come back to life in a slightly different form, which is high-dose insulin therapy that people use for calcium channel blocker and beta blocker overdose. And the problem is anytime you give high-dose insulin, and of course I will go into this a little bit more, but insulin is really the key ingredient here. Everything else is sort of supporting CAS. And so what we have is that we, we want to um, uh, change the, the way the heart functions metabolically. And if you give a lot of insulin, you end up needing to give, of course, a lot of potassium and glucose. So even though high-dose insulin therapy is the new name, uh, it's very similar to what was always traditionally called glucose insulin potassium. So... To understand that a little bit more, we need to understand metabolism a little bit. So I'll just briefly review this. And one of the things that we need to understand is the healthy heart uses 70% of its energy from free fatty acid oxidization. So basically, ATP synthesis is really derived from that, and 30% is from carbohydrates. And they're very important fuels uh, for generating more ATP than if you were to use carbohydrates. So that's what the healthy heart wants to do. But this is really quite different when the heart gets stressed. When the heart gets stressed, it prefers to use carbohydrates. And the reason is that the carbohydrates can actually replenish the Krebs cycle intermediates, whereas free fatty acid would de deplete them, would deplete those intermediates. So there's a, there's a loss in the ab ability to regenerate um, ATP. Also, even though um, free fatty acids are probably more efficient when you have oxygen. Whenever you have ischemia, you have to use more oxygen to oxidize free fatty acids. So it is not the ideal fuel to be using when the heart is very, very stressed. And so you would want the myocytes to switch to more carbohydrate metabolism. And ultimately, when uh, fatty acids accumulate, they become very toxic to the membranes and intracellular damage. Uh, lipotoxicity, eventually what happens is we get into another feedback loop where more high concentrations of free fatty acids 
will decrease the glucose utilization, decrease contractility, predispose you to dysrhythmias, free radical accumulation, and actually further increase the sympathetic tone or the catecholamines that kind of started this whole process in the first place. So what does insulin do? And again, insulin seems to be the important ingredient here. In insulin sort of forces the heart uh, to start using carbohydrate metabolism and can replenish the ATP stores. And this is becomes, it becomes a very important aspect of why you would want to use high-dose insulin therapy. And, of course, it's an inotrope and directly anti-inflammatory. You know, some of the things that happen with free fatty acid activation or metabolism is that you increase different pathways that ultimately lead in to a fibrotic or a remodeling pathway of the organ. And so to prevent it from actually scarring and, you know, the MAP kinase or activated protein kinase pathways, which are generally pro-fibrotic, you want to actually change the metabolism of the, the heart. Now, this is a paper from 1926, uh, but the idea that insulin is a direct inotrope goes actually further uh, back than this, but this is probably the best paper of its time to suggest that if you take uh, uh, a heart a cardiac fibers and you uh, use insulin, you'll see an improved increase in the contraction of the fibers. Since then, there's been several studies that suggest that's the case. And very quickly, uh, more and more uh, studies have looked at using this as protection from ischemia, the reperfusion injury in particular after coronary bypass off pump. And you can see that there's a, a profile with the patients receiving GIC preoperatively have slightly less uh, troponin leak uh, postoperatively. Now, a lot of the studies don't show an improvement in outcome or the data is quite mixed, but when you look at data, whether it's enzyme leak, whether it's cardiac performance, whether it's ejection fraction, the smaller questions are definitely easier to answer, and there does seem to be an improvement with uh, glucose insulin potassium infusion versus trying to answer the big question of outcome. So for our purposes, we may not be necessarily interested in outcome per se, but we're definitely interested in any way to pr protect the heart or prevent further damage of the heart, and actually maybe if we can regain some cardiac function. This is a more uh, recent paper, uh, 2017, and this is just looking at in, in a general cr critically ill population, non-brain dead patients, and this is uh, looking at mainly patients with sepsis or some degree of myocardial dysfunction, and they found that high-dose glucose insulin potassium was safe. The obvious is that glucose and potassium levels need to be monitored, but they did show an improvement in cardiac index, lactate levels, and actually less vasopressor requirements in these patients, and that resulted in, uh, in the uh, effect of, of GIC. Again, survival is one of those things that uh, are a much harder question to answer. I'll just finish here with just a word about dobutamine because I think dobutamine is an, another important agent. And the biggest problem with dobutamine is it's not really the same drug depending on the dose you use. And this is why it's important to use dobutamine, uh, what I would say, in a correct way. And that is that when you use low-dose dobutamine, and I'll refine that to perhaps under two mics, uh, you can actually improve the RV energetics and actually uh, without using increasing myocardial O2 consumption. It actually helps restore the high energy phosphate reserve in the, uh, in the myocytes. If you increase the dose significantly, what ends up happening is just the opposite. So one of the things we need to be careful with is the drug does not appear to sort of have a linear function. It's sort of, sort of a more bimodal approach. But this may be very, very important for um, cardiac function. And you can see here there's a big change. And so we want to confine ourselves where we don't get into the side effects being a big drop in systemic vascular resistance or a big change in heart rate. And you're not necessarily actually trying to push the cardiac index and change the right ventricular performance. So just a couple last slides, prevention, can we prevent this? Well, certainly in the animal model, say pretreatment with some of these agents would stop it. But one thing I think we can generally consider is 
trying, trying to limit exogenous catecholamines, the body's already raging with epinephrine and norepinephrine and adding more as the easy fix to, uh, to blood pressure problems in the sort of pre-donor phase may be a problem. And actually getting these patients off the, a lot of the exogenous catecholamines may be quite useful. And a lot of this does require some fluid loading. Uh, and then what about just accepting, uh, changing our, our ideas a little bit? Uh, certainly if you have a very young organ donor uh, who shouldn't really have any organic heart disease but has an ejection fraction of 20 percent, that patient may be uh, an acceptable donor and they may get better over time, maybe with a little bit of glucose, insulin, potassium, and some uh, dobutamine. Dobutamine can also be used uh, as a stress test to dis assess if there's an inotropic reserve. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can actually get the heart to actually perform better, then maybe this is a, a transient dysfunction that actually the best thing would be time and perhaps a less hostile environment. Last comment I'll make is that uh, we should treat all, every heart and every donor the same way, even if we are not going to consider the heart for transplant. One thing that's important to remember is organs, the other organs that you may be interested in cannot perfuse themselves. So both the heart and lung have a very key role in making sure other organs can be recovered. And so it's really important to, to not just think of, well, we're not going to recover the heart here, so there's no point in trying to optimize the, uh, the mechanics. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn this over now to our next speaker. Thank you uh, <clears throat> so much, Dr. Obashi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon on the East Coast. It's still morning on the West Coast, so good morning for those of you on, on my side of the country. So for the next few minutes, I would like to talk about uh, donor hearts. Uh, we'll talk about state of the art, where we are in terms of donor heart availability, and we'll talk about the uh, use and, and the declines of these donor hearts, taking into account donor risk factors. Uh, we'll talk about the marginal donor hearts and how they do post-transplantation. And finally, just end with uh, means to expand the donor pool. And here is my disclosure. Well, the big problem is uh, not enough donor hearts to go around. Um, this is from the UNOS SRTR database. And basically, it shows that the number of uh, heart transplants is about the same. We've now just broken the 2,500 mark in the United States. But you can see in the gray line above, the number of donors, uh, donors on the wait, wait, the number of patients on the wait list has been gradually increasing over the past uh, decade. And the reason why this has actually started to increase is mainly because of the use of ventricular assist devices. Now we've taken patients who are critically ill, we've actually um, not lost them, we can actually place them on assist devices, even total artificial hearts, and have them survive and actually have them become pretty good candidates for heart transplantation. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we talk about uh, why donor hearts are being declined. And that takes into account this issue right now, and that is a, that there is a national decline in donor heart utilization. Now, this is a very nice study by Karan Kush and colleagues from Stanford University. They looked at the U.S. Uh, heart transplant OPTN database. They looked at 82,000 potential uh, adult uh, heart organ donors between 1995 to 2010. There was a significant decrease in donor heart acceptance from 44% in 1995 to 29% in 2006, then back up to 32% in 2010, and there were some regional variations. The most common predictors of heart non-acceptance were older donor age, female gender, medical comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes. So overall, the findings suggest research is needed at establishing a uniform evidence-based donor utilization protocol. Well, let's look at this into, uh, into some curves here. I don't want to get too technical, it's a little busy slide, but the uh, lines here, that the hash lines, actually represent uh, numbers. And what this represents is that over a period of time, the number of donor hearts have actually increased over time. Now, there are various reasons for this. Uh, the uh, Crystal City uh, meeting was here, the collaborative meeting was here. Um, the um, geographic expansion of donors here in, in C and then D, 
represents uh, high-risk donor uh, designation. All of these actually did help to increase the, um, the number of uh, donor hearts available. What you can see in the hash green line here, the number of donors, pretty much the same. But because we have actually more donors, uh, the transplants are here, the, the percentage of transplants uh, from these uh, donors are actually decreased. But look at this, the number of declines have been increasing, whether it's a total number or percentage of numbers, they've been increasing. So we've been actually turning down many of these donor hearts. So the question is, why are we turning down these donor hearts? Um, this slide here shows the various reasons. In panel A, you have donor uh, characteristics over time. And when you look at the characteristics, so we're now using older donors, you know, age greater than 50. We're now using uh, donors with uh, hypertension. And that's been increasing over time. Um, diabetic uh, donors have also been increasing. But what has this done in terms of the acceptance rate? Well, you can see here in the, in the orange here, this is female donors have actually been decreasing and uh, donors with the cause of death of uh, CVA have been decreasing, and then hypertensive donors have been um, decreasing as well as age greater than 50. Uh, and why is this actually happening right around here? Well, as I mentioned, now, you know, in the um, mid-2000s, we had uh, very sick patients. We did not have assist devices for these patients. And you know what? Whenever we had a patient like this, we took whatever donor came by. Even if it had a lot of risk factors, wasn't working as well, we would take it. Now we have these assist devices. Now we've taken these most critically ill patients and turned them into stable patients. And what do we do now? Now we wait. We wait for the pristine donor to come by. And that's why the uh, donor declines have occurred. Well, more recently, the uh, donor declines have occurred. Uh, have uh, decreased and now we're accepting more of them. But this all translated to a survival benefit here, yeah, as you can see here, one year survival has been gradually increasing. And one could argue that now we've taken those sickest patients, we've made them better stable candidates, and they do indeed do better after transplantation. Well, let me move on. <clears throat> what about these risk factors? Well, these risk factors are ones that we might call them uh, then marginal donors. Older age, greater than 50, history of drug abuse, left ventricular hypertrophy, borderline ejection fraction, less than 50%, and comorbidities uh, such as diabetes and hypertension. All of these factors have been um, evaluated post-transplant and found to actually uh, decrease uh, survival in these patients. When we look at this graph here, this is basically the odds ratio. And if you use 0.5 here, that means about half of these donors are not being used. Well, and in fact, if you have a female donor right here, that's about 40% of the donors. Donors that die from CVA or stroke is almost half. So you can see that quite a few donors are not being used uh, in this slide. So the question arises, are we missing the point here? Are we not using these marginal donors that might be okay? Well, um, Dr. Kush actually took a look at this, and there is a retrospective analysis that demonstrates that when these hearts are transplanted, they do not result in worse outcomes. Now, this graph is a little bit busy here, but if you look at the, um, the, the gray bar here, this is uh, with one uh, risk factor, and this is with four plus risk factors, and this is the, um, the zero point, meaning no risk factors, and that's where your odds ratio is one. But when you look at one-year survival for one risk factor, it's pretty good. It's uh, below the odds ratio, meaning it has better survival. If you look at here with two risk factors, we're right on it, the same survival as no risk factors. If you look at three risk factors, again, the same, four risk factors or more, the same in terms of one-year survival. So I think if you select these donors quite well, even though they have risk factors, they are pretty good. And that suggests that the more liberal use of donor hearts with relative contraindications may actually increase the donor pool without compromising outcomes. And I think more and more uh, centers are now taking these marginal hearts, realizing that they can impact their uh, patients on the wait list by getting a transplant and actually getting full benefit from the transplant. And so we go back to that. The enemy of, is, of good is perfect. Let's not wait for that perfect donor heart. I think good is maybe good enough with some of these risk factors that we've seen here. Now, what uh, other ways might we be able to increase the donor pool? And this is the use of ex vivo perfusion. You can possibly expand the donor pool. 
Uh, the organ care system is a clinical platform that allows ex vivo perfusion of donor hearts, meaning having the donor heart perfused outside the body, preser preserving it in a warm, beating state during procurement. Now, we actually did a study called the Proceed 2 Trial, and this was a prospective open-label multicenter randomized non-inferiority trial at 10 heart transplant centers in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, more than 160, uh, 130 patients were randomized. It was aimed to assess the clinical outcome of the organ care system compared with standard cold storage of human donor hearts for transplantation. So what are we actually talking about in terms of this organ care system? Well, uh, this is what it's like. Uh, Hetty, if you can actually start the uh, video on this. You can see the heart can, heart can beat. We actually take a liter and a half of uh, blood from the donor and we uh, perfuse the heart with uh, oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and the heart can actually beat, well, we like to say for, forever, but that's really not the case. Well, we can take it out for hours at a time. Well, let me show you some of the data from this uh, trial. Uh, eligible heart transplant candidates greater than 18 years were randomly assigned to receive a donor heart preserved with the organ care system or standard code storage. The primary endpoint was 30-day patient and graft survival with a 10% non-inferiority margin. And between 2010 to 2013, 130 patients were randomized to the uh, uh, study, the 67 in the organ care system, 63 in the cold storage. So what did we actually find? The 30-day in patient graft survival rates were 94% in the organ care system, 97% in the standard cold storage group, and basically they were the same, they were non-inferior. However, the total preservation time was significantly longer in the ex vivo per heart perfusion versus the control. And I'll show you a graph on that. The longest per preservation time in the study was 9.7 hours. Well, 9.7 hours, we can take hearts across the country. We can take hearts, at least on the West Coast, from Hawaii, from Alaska. And maybe uh, this will uh, even the playing field across the, uh, the various uh, ge uh, geographical uh, regions as well. And so the authors concluded that the ex vivo heart perfusion platform allows the donor hearts to have a longer preservation time and may facilitate long distance procurement and possible expansion of the donor pool. Well, let me show you a graph. I think it's going to be very uh, interesting to look at this. This is the total preservation time, meaning time out of the body. Cold storage is about 180 hours in, in general. Uh, organ care system, we took it out to more than 300 uh, minutes. Excuse me, these are minutes, not hours. Um, but when you look at the uh, cold ischemic time, the organ care system was only about 120 minutes. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that we are taking uh, the donor heart, putting it in, into a uh, cold, uh, cold uh, solution, for the time we take it out of the donor into the heart in the box, and then the heart will uh, contract in warm perfusion in the box itself, and then we'll cool it down again and take it out of the box and put it into the uh, donor, I mean to the recipient. Now this would be standard also in the cold storage, but the rest of the time here from here upward is the transit time. Now in the organ care system, the heart is beating. So it's not in uh, cold ischemic time. And that's why the cold ischemic time will always be the same, about 120 minutes. But we can take it out to, you know, 10 hours out here if necessary to, for transport. So this is a very exciting area. Uh, some programs are now using the organ care system for long distance procurement. And so far the data looks great in terms of preserving these uh, donor hearts. Now, what else can we do in terms of this organ uh, procurement and this organ care system. There's something called donation after circuitory death, DCD donors. And they could expand uh, potential donor pool and it's currently being used in kidney, liver, lung transplant, but prior to this, not with heart transplantation. So there is an initial experience with Australian case series of three transplant recipients from DCD donors and they've been doing quite well. So now more than 20 DCD donors are being performed worldwide. So what about these DCD donors? Who are they? What do they represent? Well, these DCD donors usually involve younger ventilated patients with extensive brain damage not qualifying for brain death whose family doctors agreed to withdraw care. These patients can donate organs after the heart ceases to beat with a five-minute standoff time. 
Now, the organ care system has been used to recover donor hearts in 20 cases reported in Australia and Great Britain, and it is predicted that organ donation might increase by up to 30% with these cases. So again, we're very excited about this uh, possibility as well. Now, how else might we increase the donor pool? Well, some, maybe with some policy. Well, Lynn Stevenson wrote this nice editorial, the uh, urgent priority for transplantation is to trim the waiting list. Now, let's bring down that waiting list so that now we have enough uh, donors for all the recipients that really need it. This is an ideal listing system should place the patients with the highest risk without transplant with highest priority. Those with highest priority patients should have reasonably short waiting times and a reasonable amount of patients at a lower priority level will still undergo transplantation. Now, this cannot occur with a waiting list that far exceeds the donor heart supply, and currently patients generally must deteriorate in order to win higher priority, which in turn jeopardizes the outcome. I show you this slide here just to show that the um, 1A and 1B, meaning the urgent status and the triangles here, are approaching almost all of the donors uh, uh, that are being used for uh, transplantation. And in some programs, some regions, only 1A and 1B type patients urgent uh, uh, listing are actually getting the donor heart. The patients that the two are dwindling and rarely are they getting donor hearts here. So what Dr. Stevenson suggested was this proposal. Trim status two listings, which already have limited access to donor hearts and is tantamount to placebo therapy. They're never going to get a donor heart. Potential benefit scores should be used to determine listing rather than priority after listing. Those who do not meet the score requirements would be registered for future listing. And patients on the list should be reevaluated periodically to ensure they still qualify. And this is very controversial. We should consider trimming the list by age, given increased worse outcome in older patients and the emergency, emergence of VAD, ventricular assistance device, as destination therapy for these older patients. That's something that uh, is uh, being considered in some programs. And finally, in terms of increasing the organ donation through policy, we know that Spain and Portugal do have uh, more donors in general, and this may be due to the fact that Spain has consistently produced highest rates of organ donation, um, and there's some fundamental aspects of the Spanish model. It focuses on timely identification and referral. Uh, transplant donor coordinators are essential component, and basically they're there at the uh, end of life care and uh, having a relationship with the family. There is a quality assurance program that exists as a tool to define and monitor potential of donor uh, organ donation. And finally, presumed consent laws exist in Spain. However, prior to the introduction of these laws, there was no difference in donation rates. <clears throat> and there are other policies. Presumed consent laws have been discussed as a method of increased donation. Uh, data shows that societal and cultural factors are far more likely to impact organ donation than presumed consent laws. For example, countries with more Catholics demonstrate significantly higher rates of donation. Uh, in different European countries, donation varies uh, widely to, uh, despite all having presumed consent systems. And in some countries, the presumed consent policy has never been strictly applied in practice. Relatives are always approached and always have the final say. So in summary, as more patients are added to the heart transplant wait list in the U.S., the shortage of donor hearts looms larger. Donor heart usage in the U.S. has decreased over the past two decades for various reasons, and now, now more recently with a slight uptick. Approaches to expand the donor heart pool include use of marginal donors, ex vivo donor heart perfusion, DCD donor hearts, increased organ donation through policy and awareness, and finally, perhaps a stricter criteria for listing patients on the heart transplant wait list may ease the donor shortage. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabashiko and Dr. Habashi for uh, fantastic presentations. Before I turn it back to William to moderate the questions, just as a reminder for everybody, um, we are recording this webinar, so in order to post questions, you need to submit them electronically. On the bottom left-hand corner is a chat icon. Just click on that and type in your question, and then we uh, will moderate it on this end. During the Q&A time, I will have this poll up. For those of you listening in a group, please complete this poll and let us know how many people are in your group. I will turn it back to William to uh, start with questions. <clears throat> 
Thanks, Katie. Uh, first question is for Dr. Abashi. Have you encountered resistance from donor hospital pharmacies uh, regarding the GIC protocol? And how would you suggest introducing it and uh, diminishing some of that concern that pharmacy may have about uh, the GIC therapy? Uh, well, thank you for that question, William. I think that uh, the, the quick answer is absolutely. We have, uh, uh, you know, generally anything new is, is, I guess, rightfully so, scrutinized a little bit more carefully. However, in the big scheme of things, I would just say that, you know, giving insulin and monitoring glucose levels is a, is a lot less uh, intense than actually cardiac transplant. I think that's uh, just to keep things in perspective. So something we do in the ICU quite a bit is actually monitor glucose levels and give insulin. So we're giving a sort of an extreme version of that, uh, so to speak. And so no doubt we need to monitor those things. I think what uh, what is somewhat confusing is the literature goes back so far and people have uh, used this in a bunch of uh, patients that had, uh, you know, diabetes, non-diabetes, and hyperglycemia, and it seems as though the effect of insulin, the beneficial effect, is actually negated by giving, producing hyperglycemia. So it becomes important not to produce hyperglycemia. We also have the, the differences in dosing. There's high dose, there's low dose. In general, it favors the high dose insulin versus the low dose in all the sort of spectrum of studies. And again, if you try to find one good study that gives you an outcome, you're not going to find it. So we have to decide whether that applies to the organ donor. And to some extent, you know, as I said before, we're not interested in outcome per se for that particular donor. We're interested in, in changing their cardiac function. And that, in the, the short answer, is that it seems to actually affect the way the heart works. So that's kind of the educational piece. The last thing I would say is, of course, we want to make it as as friendly as possible, the solution as friendly as possible for the pharmacy so that it is not a very labor-intensive and potentially error-filled uh, 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 endeavor to actually come up with this solution. And there are some ways to do that, to, to actually come up with a formulation that is, you know, just easier for people to make up and, and less risk of not putting enough uh, glucose in or putting too much insulin in and so forth. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Kabashigawa, question for you. Uh, could you speak to the recipient factors that weigh in on your donor heart selection? <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, this is actually becoming more of an issue, uh, mainly because um, you know, there, are, there are many factors that occur in the recipient. You know, the ventricular assist devices uh, do have a lot of scarring. And um, when uh, they actually go in, the surgeons go in, there's a lot of bleeding that occurs. And um, these patients are actually high risk because they do bleed a lot, the blood pressure goes down, and uh, you have a big inflammatory response as well. Um, and uh, because of that, um, you know, a lot of blood products are being poured, it, poured in, and bleeding still occurs even after the uh, donor heart's put in. And the right ventricle actually does dilate because of the uh, volumes of uh, blood products that are being uh, put into the recipient just to keep them going. And so that's why a lot of the um, surgeons uh, demand a, you might say, a younger donor uh, with a good right ventricle that can tolerate a lot of the blood products that are being put in. Uh, and in the case of primary graft dysfunction, what we're finding now is that the recipient uh, milieu actually is very important. Um, in some studies that we are doing with uh, the uh, Columbia University, we're looking at actually some uh, inflammatory molecules. And what we're finding is that uh, there are high levels of inflammatory molecules, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases, for example, um, are elevated in patients who develop uh, primary graft dysfunction. So basically, we're putting the donor heart into an infl inflammatory milieu, in which case it's going to fail. And that may be part of the reason why we see severe primary graft dysfunction. And so, yes, the recipient has a lot to do with outcome, and, uh, and that's why we have to be quite selective, not only the donor, but uh, in the recipient as well, and try to match the donor to the recipient in terms of risk. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, 
Um, some more questions. Um, Dr. Abashi, is there any indication for cardiac MRI and evaluation uh, of heart function? Many OPOs manage their donors for 48 plus hours with serial echoes. Could MRI assist? Um, I, I would have to answer by saying that the, the likelihood of that being uh, beneficial over a bedside echo uh, is very, very slim. Uh, I think the, the ability to do this at the bedside is going to be vastly superior to trying to transport a very sick patient, a very sick donor, uh, through all that logistics, and you're not going to get a significant improvement. Uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, resolution you need to know that the heart's dysfunctional and not acceptable for transplant is pretty good with the echo. So I, th I would just limit it to, to the echo. As far as serial echoes are concerned, I think right off the bat, whether you use anything for the heart or not, is not to do an echo as soon as you arrive with the donor uh, on site because the, frequently the, but at the initial phase of the closer, you, the more proximal you are to the herniation, the worse the cardiac function is. And of everything we talked about, time is probably the most important aspect of cardiac recovery. So even if you just delay your echo to a time where the, the donor is a little more stable, so if you expand that 48 hours and say instead of doing it in the first uh, six hours of uh, donor management, you're doing it in the, at least the middle to the latter half, then what you will more likely have is a better echo. Got it. Thank you. And another question for you, Dr. Habashi. Do you want to discuss the dosing in GIC at all, or would you like to hold that, hold off on that? Um, yes, I, I certainly can. The again, the the sort of lack of of real solid data is that uh, it's really the insulin. The key component here is the insulin, not the glucose and the potassium. And so, depending on uh, um, you know, what kind of um, uh, protocol you want to use. The literature, again, is just full of the different dosing of, of insulin. We tend to use a, the higher dose uh, levels of, of glucose, uh, in, I mean, of, of insulin. And that means that you're going to be at least uh, on the low end 0.3 to 1 units per kilogram per hour. Um, and that, that's where you get into some really high doses. You actually do need to give high dose insulin. So suffice it to say that, you know, there's more to it than that because you cannot just give high-dose insulin. You're going to have a change in glucose, so you need to give the appropriate amount of glucose, and you also are going to drive potassium inside into the cell, and so potassium becomes an important uh, component as well. So it'd probably be better to look up or, you know, or I guess we're happy to share our protocol as well, which is really the high dose protocol. The donor is a little bit more complex, I would say, than many of these other patients because we have a uh, high rate of inflammation which uh, and high rate of catecholamines, which increases insulin resistance and it changes uh, uh, carbohydrate metabolism in itself. That's one of the things catecholamines do. And then we give steroids, and steroids frequently lead to an increase in glucose level. So. There's a lot going on with the donor that makes dosing glucose, insulin, potassium a little bit more challenging than I would say some of the studies suggest in the sort of non-donor application. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kobashigawa, uh, for the OPOs that have thoracic reviews with their uh, heart transplant centers, do you have any suggestions to uh, in terms of having a conversation with those centers about looking into good hearts versus the perfect heart. Any way, any suggestions for OPOs to have uh, maybe see increased utilization in their transplant centers? Yeah. <clears throat> One of the big issues is um, outcomes, and um, <clears throat> this is a truly a regulatory issue um, where if you use these marginal hearts, you may not have a good outcome. And if you're only doing 10 hearts a year, Having one or two extra uh, deaths uh, will will and may have a red flag waving where you may be reviewed, and, and so the big issue that we're looking at right now is whether or not we can state that uh, some of these marginal donors may may perhaps should not be 
use in terms of your outcomes, and that would actually encourage more programs to use these use these marginal hearts uh, per se. And so there's a lot of discussion that's going on, <clears throat> and but I, I think though as uh, more uh, programs become um, more experienced, they will find that these marginal donors actually do quite well. And I might add, the marginal donor of yesterday is now the uh, usual donor of today. And so that's why I say we are evolving over time. Fantastic. Uh, I think this is going to be our last question. Dr. Bashi, can you share your thoughts on using T4 in heart recruitment? Okay, if I have to, yes. Uh, well, I think uh, T4 is another uh, agent that we can use, and there's some data on T4. I would have to say the data has some problems, um, and we know that not all of the – when you compare anterior, to, anterior pituitary hormones versus posterior pituitary hormones, you find that we're more likely to have a problem with posterior pituitary hormones than anterior. In fact, many donors at the time of recovery still – secrete TSH. And so the question is, what, the, what is the role of uh, T4? Now, of course, T4 is biologically inert, and so it actually does nothing for you. It has to be converted to T3 in the body, and that is sometimes not a guarantee to occur in a sick donor. And then the last thing is there's always question about how stable T4 is. So I think from a practical perspective, we may not – uh, get the benefit of T4 in every single donor, and it might be actually the minority of the donors. And so my opinion really is that we shouldn't just rely on T4 as the sole way to fix a heart. Uh, I think that the metabolism of the heart's important, and all of those components uh, uh, are important as far as doing everything you can to optimize all the organs, and in particular, the lung and the heart, because they do support all the other organs. So, in my opinion, we shouldn't just limit it to T4. Understood. Thank you for that. Well, uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Habashi and Dr. Kabashgawaf, both for your time and really fantastic and very educational presentation. So, Really great, and thank you, William, for moderating and planning um, this webinar, and to all of the participants, thank you so much for your time as well, and we wish you a wonderful rest of the week.